Okay, Hare Krishna. Welcome everyone. Bhakti Vai Recording in progress. We're studying the third canto, Kapila Shiksha. Today we're beginning chapter number 30. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tismai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kadhatar Shri Vasadigor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, welcome Prabhu, so we'll go straight to the PowerPoint. We're studying this chapter number 30, entitled Adverse Fruitive Activities. Okay, everybody's there. You can see the PowerPoint. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Good. We'll go ahead. Okay, you want to do prayers to Srimad Bhagavatam? Sanatana Goswami's prayers. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar churn from the ocean of all scriptures, you are the most prominent. You are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas, enriched with the jewel of all conclusive truth. You grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has risen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna who has returned among us. O Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss. Because your syllable shower pure love of God upon the reader, you are always to be served by everyone, for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O my deliverer, O my good fortune, O my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O bestower, of saintliness to the unsaintly, O uplifter of the most fallen, please don't ever leave me, accompanied by pure love of Krishna. Please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. Okay, so we'll go straight into the overview of chapter 30. So we're going to hear about the time factor. That's continuing from the previous chapter. Lord Kapila Dev was asked by Devahuti to describe about the effects of time and he began at the end of chapter 29. There was some verses there in relation to the time factor and it continues into this chapter number 30. How the time factor deludes the conditioned living entities and causes them to enjoy illusory satisfaction. So we'll be hearing about that. And we'll hear also about how householders become bewildered 
enjoying the temporary as if it were permanent. They do this until old age and death. But that goes all the way up to verse, from set, verse 6 up to verse 19. And then verses 20 to 34. After death, the bewildered soul is punished for his sinful attempts at enjoyment. All right, so that's the chapter. And here's the connection. Devahuti had inquired about the effects of time and about the continuous cycle of births and deaths. That came up in the beginning of chapter 29, verses 3 and 4. And Lord Kapila started to answer these questions at the end of chapter 29, beginning in verses 37 up to the end of the chapter, verse 45. Continuing in this chapter now, Lord Kapila will speak powerfully with the intention of awakening renunciation in our hearts. Now, why do you think he would want to awaken renunciation in our hearts? Would anyone like to tell me why? Why would Lord Kapila speak so powerfully that he wants to awaken renunciation in us? Yes? Sri Nitai Prabhu? Is it because to relieve her of that uh, separation from her husband and give her uh, adequate knowledge? Well, he's not just speaking to her. What about us? Why does he want to awaken renunciation in our hearts? To advance in our devotional service, because uh, devotional service, the advance in, advancement in devotional service is directly proportional to the amount of renunciation. So the more we renounce, the more we advance. Really? The more we renounce, the more what? The more, we more we advance in devotional service is uh, proportional to the amount of uh, renunciation. Well, of course, we have to be careful about that. We might become dry renunciants. Right? There are people very renounced, they're not devotees. So we have to be careful about dry renunciation. Just simply dry renunciation, extreme renunciation, that is not what we want. Right? What we do want to do, however, is to replace that uh, attachment to sense gratification. We want to awaken attachment to Krishna. So if we're going to be attached to Krishna, there has to be some renunciation there. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't overemphasize over renunciation. The renunciation if it's too much, you know, if we go too extreme into renunciation, then the heart just becomes hard. So we want soft hearts to experience the connection, the loving relationship with the Lord. So we're warned about too much renunciation or too much cultivation of knowledge, too much gyan, too much vairagya. It's not so good. We want to, the heart should be soft so that we can experience loving relationships and feelings with the Lord. So that's the idea. So we, there has to be some detachment in the world, uh, from the world, and that way then we can become attached to Krishna. And we can replace that renunciation. Instead of being renounced from the world, we want to become attached to Krishna. Okay, who would like to read for us here? May I read, Maharaj? Please, Prabhu. Whatever is produced by the materialist with great pain and labor for happiness, the Supreme Personality as the time factor destroys. And for this reason, the conditioned soul laments. The misguided materialist does not know that his very body is impermanent and that the attractions of home, land, and wealth, which are in relationship to that body, are also temporary. Out of ignorance only, he thinks that everything is permanent. Thank you, Prabhu. 
All right, so you can see in the picture the time glass, the sand there, this showing the, the passage of time. And so materialistic people, they're oblivious to the time factor. Materialistic people, they're simply thinking that they will conquer time. And they will think, I will live here forever. The materialistic people are all under that illusion and that we will live forever. Nobody's thinking about the effects of time. Although we see the effects of time at every moment and all the time it's in front of us, the effects of time are there, still we're, we're not thinking about it. We're not making any attempt to do anything about it. And rather we're thinking, well, when the time comes, I'll do something about it. You know, <laughs> you know and we see people, when the time comes, they run to the doctors, they go to the hospital, and they spend so much money, and they go to all, so many things to try to do, to prolong their life in the material world. And why are they trying to prolong their life in the material world? To enjoy all the things they've worked hard to acquire, their money, their family members, and their palace, their kingdom. But both the king and the kingdom, they'll come to an end. They're all temporary. They don't last forever. So many great empires were there in the past. Where are they now, right? What are some of the empires which were all finished in the course of time? Yes? Can you name some empire which was there? Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, yeah. The, the Ottoman Empire. Which empire? Ottoman. The Ottoman. Ottoman. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where was that? Ottoman. Where were they? I think they were uh, taking the, the whole of um, the Middle East and the East East, um, East a uh, West Asia, I think so. Oh, okay. Anything, anybody else? Uh, Maharaj, your question is uh, that uh, any empire which actually was very glorious and it was later on destroyed. Yeah, yeah. The Prabhupada talks about, he said, the, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, you know, all of these things, you know. They've all crumbled in the course of time. You know, you had a, all these different European countries, they had empires, there was the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire, and, and the French also had something. But everything gone in the course of time. So... Time and tide, wait for no man. Oh. Yes, someone can read for us now? Maraji, Maraji, read for us. Out of illusion, only does the materialist accept his home, his land, and his money as permanent. Out of his illusion, the family life, national life, and economic development which are very important factors in modern civilization, have grown. A conscious person knows that this economic development of human society is but temporary illusion. Mm. Yes. A conscious person knows this economic development is a temporary illusion. And so what does that tell us about the, the different political leaders of so many mm. nations in the world? They're all focused on economic development. And for them, economic development is the goal and it's essential and there must be economic development. There must be this development of the economy. Everybody must have more. They have to have more sense gratification. Everyone should have, they should have more money. They should have, be able to have more homes, more houses, more cars, right? All of these things. And this is what they think, economic development. They're thinking these things are very important. So economic development just simply means sense gratification. They want to develop the economy so they can satisfy their senses. 
but they have not learned. The senses are never satisfied. The senses are always burning with lust, they're never satisfied. But the foolish people are thinking, they're not thinking like that, they're thinking everything, my nation, my country, my land, my money, it's all permanent. Some, we, we, we have seen in India sometimes people have money and then all of a sudden the money is no value. Just like I remember when Indira Gandhi was in power, one night she cancelled all the 1,000 rupee notes and the next morning 1,000 rupee notes had no value. So people had 1,000 rupee notes, they were just using them to, to burn, <laughs> they, were, they had no value anymore because she cancelled them. And then recently, of course, also with the Modi regime, he also did the same thing. He cancelled the 500 rupee note and the 100 rupee, 1000 rupee note. And so the governments do this. They can do this. And then the same thing happened in America. When there was a north, the northern, north of USA and the southern USA, and they had different money. Their money became useless. And so we're thinking these things are so permanent, but actually they're so temporary. There's, everything is so temporary. We have not understood the real nature of the material world. Alright, so we have to understand how to apply the principles of detachment in relation to Krishna. And of course the term for this is yukta vairagya. So we want to hear, hear some points which are coming up about the problems with material life. Mohad greha shetra vasani. Out of illusion only does the, nation, does the materialist accept his home, his land and his money as permanent. Nothing is permanent in this material world. When, however, one is enlightened in Krishna consciousness, he can use these for the service of the Lord. That is a very suitable proposition. Everything has a relationship with Krishna. When all economic development and material advancement are utilized to advance the cause, of Krishna Consciousness, a new phase of progressive life arises. Text number 3 of chapter 30, Purpur. So Srila Prabhupada is guiding us how to understand the proper use of economic development. As he said, nothing wrong with economic development. It has, a, has its use if it's in relationship with Krishna, if we know how to use it. Just like advancement of technology. We're not, we're not against the advancement of technology. When Prabhupada went to America, people were challenging him. They said, oh, are you against our advancement of technology? Are you against our development of the nation? And Prabhupada said, no, I've simply come to teach you the one thing you've forgotten. He said, you have forgotten about God. So I've come to teach you that. I'm not against your advancement of technology or your advancement of the economy. I just want to remind you how to use these things properly. And they should be used in the service of the Supreme Lord. Everything has its relationship in Krishna consciousness. So nothing wrong with money. We can use money to put up nice temples and to put on festivals of Krishna consciousness, to distribute prasadam and to print transcendental literatures and distribute them for the benefit of mass of people. There's so many things can be done in the service of Krishna. We're not against it all, but sometimes it, it's just over, it's given too much importance and they neglect the most important part of life. The real problem of life is 
Krishna consciousness, that we have forgotten Krishna. Then when we forget Krishna, then everything is useless. So the real problem of life, you can see, right? This, this is the problem. These are the problems we have to deal with. How to deal with these problems? Taking birth again in the material world, taking another birth. And then disease is there. So much disease, we know, we're all so much concern about how to deal with this virus which is going around. One virus after another, if, it, if it's not cancer, then it's COVID, and then we have so many other things like you have dengue and malaria, there's so many different diseases all the time, you're faced with them. And still there's a problem of death, it's old age and death that's going to come. Even if you, if you survive, if you go on, then you come to old age and then die. You have to die, that's going to be there. So the real problem is solving these problems. Okay, so two phases of Maya. That's Avaranatmika and Shepanatmika. All right, somebody like to read for us text number four, the quote? A living entity in whatever species of life he appears finds a particular type of satisfaction in that species and is never aware to being situated in such a condition. Do you agree with this? Yes. Can you agree with this? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, can you give some examples? Uh, like Maharaj, in current situation, like we are not used to use, the, uh, have the mask and going in the public place. But after so, uh, using the uh, mask for so long, it appears that mask, having, uh, putting the mask is natural. And people are getting satisfied using that natural without any convenience. <laughs> yeah, put the mask on, cover the face, right? Yeah, we're thinking we're safe. Put the mask on, I'm safe. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Can you keep reading? The condition living entity is satisfied in his own particular species of life, but deluded by the covering influence of the illusionary energy. He feels little inclined to cast off his body, even when in hell, or he takes delight in hellish enjoyment. He takes delight in hellish enjoyment. Yeah, you, well, you gave an example with people, people don't like putting their masks on, they feel comfortable when they put the mask on. They, they're actually very unhealthy, very unhealthy things to do, to be wearing a mask all the time. You breathe in your own air again. So, uh, we take delight in hellish enjoyment. Yeah, we can see, actually what, what people think is, uh, their pleasure for a devotee is just hellish. But people are thinking it's enjoying. We see, for example, how the pig, the pig is happy when he gets his food, when they bring the pig food. The pig is so happy. And what are they bringing to, for the pig to eat? They're bringing all the slop, all the whatever's left over, whatever people don't want, and they they feed all this garbage to the pigs, and the pigs are so happy. Oh, my, my dinner is coming, my lunch. And they fill themselves up, and they can eat so much. And they're thinking, this is happiness. And the same way some people, they take pleasure in, in hellish things, you know, things like alcohol. People drink alcohol, it's another hell. Alcohol. It's a horrible thing, it's, it had terrible effects on the livers and it burns the organs. But people will drink and they're thinking this is enjoyment. They will spend so much money to buy. And similarly cigarettes, people will buy cigarettes and they think, oh this is enjoyment, they're enjoying. All over the world people are smoking cigarettes and they're thinking this is pleasure. It's just another hell. 
when we look at the life of the material world, we see it's so much hellish enjoyment. But people are thinking, this is pleasure. All right. Oh, here we go. There they are. So, they're happy. The birds, they live in the nests. They're happy. They eat some warm. And then the monkeys, they can sit very quiet for some time. And then suddenly they move and they will steal something from you. They give you so much trouble. And the pig, poor thing. So those are creatures who misuse their independence. When we see these animals, we should think with compassion on them that they've misused their life, misused their independence. Therefore, they've been given these animal forms. All right, somebody like to read for us? Krishna's family, family and Maya's family. The family we maintain is created by Maya. It is the perverted reflection of the family in Krishna Loka. In Krishna Loka, there are also family, friends, society, father and mother. Everything is there, but they are eternal. Here, as we change bodies, our family relationship also changes. Sometimes we are in a family of human beings, sometimes in a family of demigods, sometimes in a family of cats, or sometimes in a family of dogs. So this is the situation that we become very attached to our family. We're very concerned for the family. We work so hard, we, take, we have so much anxiety for the family, to take care of the family. It's so difficult. There's always so many problems and sometimes quarreling in the family. So many difficulties are there, but we will take great efforts to maintain the family, to keep the family together. But in course of time, the family will be separated. And we know the stories about how uh, it was Srivas Thakur, he had a child, a young, there was a child in his house and Lord Chaitanya was having kirtan there one night. And one child died with a fever, he passed away from the world. And so in the morning Lord Chaitanya found out about it. Lord Chaitanya was surprised that Srivas had not told Lord Chaitanya about the passing of the boy. And Lord Chaitanya came and put his hand on the chest of the boy and then requested the boy, where are you going? Why are you leaving here? At that time the boy came back to life and spoke words to everyone and said, who is my father and who is my mother? I have had many fathers and mothers. I have passed my time according to my karma. I passed my time in this family. Now that time is up. It's time for me to leave and go to another family take birth some other place. So hearing the child speak philosophy, everyone who had been grieving, everyone became convinced. They understood the nature of the soul and they no longer lamented. So our life is like that. We're, some, we're in one family, sometimes in one family, sometimes in another family. It's not eternal. But we do have a family which is eternal, and that is the family in the spiritual world, in Krishna Loka. And Prabhupada said there's also family there. So that is actually the real family. We want to be there with that, with our family there. Uh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was asked, uh, what is better, the Brahmachari ashram or the Grihastha ashram? So when Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada was asked this question, he thought for a minute and then he looked at the devotees asking the question and he said to them, actually he said, Grihastha Ashram is better. But then he said to them, 
not the Grihastha family of this world. He said the family of Nanda Maharaj. He said the real family is the family of Nanda Maharaj. You want to go to that family and be in the family, be with the family of Nanda Maharaj. That is in the spiritual world. So that is the best ashram. None of these ashrams here in this world are eternal. They're all temporary. All right, someone else read, please. Manaji. Family, society, uh, precious family and Maya Samu. Family, society and friendship are flickering. And so they are called Asad. It is said that as long as we are attached to this Asad, temporary, no non-existent society and family, we are always full of anxieties. The materialists do not know that the family, society and friendship here in this material world are only shadows and thus they become attached. In 3.30.7 mm. why, why, do, why do they become attached? Uh, because they think that uh, we have we are, uh, like we have to stay here only and they are uh, very attached to the family uh, well, that way um, why 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 they become attached because uh, they, they think that we we are here for forever and yeah. they don't yeah yes right yes they we're thinking this family to be eternal right mm. we're thinking this is my family this is these are my family forever. <laughs> we don't realize the actual nature, how the family is very flickering, as, right? The nature of the material world, everything is flickering. And just like we sing that song, talk about flickering happiness, right? Chapala sukha lagire. Edina yamini, huh? How does it go? And this song by Lochandas, Bajahari Mana Shri Nanda Nandana, Habaya Charanara Vindari. So it talks about flickering happiness. They work very hard serving wicked and miserly people just to get some flickering happiness. Chapala Sukalaba Lagire. Etana yovana putra parijana itiki achipara nitire. Kamala dala jala jivana talamala vajahu haripada nitire. Right? The, this, the life is tottering. Nothing is steady in the material world. So we should worship Lord Hari. This life is tottering. And goes on, just like a drop of water on the lotus flower. And so the water rolls off the lotus leaf back into the water. So like that material life, always full of anxieties. The non-existing society and family, always full of anxiety. So this is the, this is the nature of this world. The spiritual world is Vaikuntha, no anxiety, but we're in this world of anxiety. So much anxiety. Oh, I will lose my job. I have a job, I'll lose my job. Maybe I'm going to lose my job. Maybe there's no work. Because of this COVID, so many people, they lost their jobs. And they have no job, then they have no food. They have no income, there's no food for the family members. So many, so much anxiety all over the world. It's like that. So the family, society, friendship is only shadows, but we become attached. We become attached to the shadow. We have to know what is the reality. All right, so a little exercise for you. How many people do we have in the class today? 13 Maharaj. 13, all right. 12 Maharaj. So, 12 Maharaj. Huh? 12. 12, okay, so six pairs. 
talking about it, every, and it the, right? And you, you have to reflect on an experience in your life when the principles described in Srimad Bhagavatam regarding the temporary nature of material family relationships became apparent to you. Well, we hope it became apparent to you at some point. <laughs> right? We hope it's become apparent. We'd like to hear from you. All right, so we'll give you five minutes to do that. Okay, Maharaj, can I open the rooms? Yes, please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Who is your partner? Um, actually, I see only only you in this room. Uh, no, there's there's three of us here. Sachi Tanay Prabhu. Yes. Hare Krishna Tanabhatsu Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu Tanabhats. Hare Krishna. So, do you have any experiences like this? Wait. But you could realize the temporary nature of these relationships? Um, I can say for myself that um, being in, in a family life since uh, uh, 13 years, 13 years, I think I cannot specify uh, some, some specific uh, particular incident, but um, just, just the the nature. Can you hear me well? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Simply the nature of uh, uh, family life. It's just dragging. Uh, there's so much expenses all the time, and there is. Uh, a, it's it's like a, a, a magic circle. Whenever you think it's, everything is fine materially, then there's another thing to take care of. So. It's quite obvious. Um, uh, it's quite obvious that it leads nowhere. Uh, I mean, spiritually speaking, it leads nowhere. In, at least my my humble experience. And of course, by reading, by learning this this um, this uh, the whole of these units since since the beginning of Canto One up to now, it becomes very very clear. Okay, is your wife also a devotee? Yeah, of course. We, we actually live here in Mayapur. Oh, okay. Since three years. Okay, where were you living before that? Israel. Oh. It was very, um, very harsh, harsh life. Just a casual life of work, work and sleep. What did what did you do there in Israel? I worked as a computer technician. Oh, okay. Then uh, see, seeing the family only on on weekends and then being very tired and so it's very obvious that there is not not much to to await. But but when everything is centered around Krishna, then then. Uh, like Kapila Dev says, then everything becomes very um, satisfying to does, everyone. Does your life change a lot being here in Mayapur? Yes, so much, so much. It's much better for you? Yes, un, uh, uncomparably. Oh, okay, good. Do you, what service do you do here in Mayapur? The same. Oh, computer technician. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Are you working for a company or for the Mayapur itself? No, no. I, I fix hardware. I just fix the, the computers of the devotees and the different departments here. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> Good. What about Sachi Tanui? Hare Krishna Maharaj, <coughs> one of uh, nearby one devotee is there. <coughs> he lost the job after uh, this COVID situation. He was serving uh, Sri Lanka temple. <coughs> and uh, after this COVID situation, he lost the job and uh, he went back to his land home. He is staying nearby me. And um, he recently got married and after this COVID situation, he lost the job and uh, because of that, he could not uh, maintain his family and his wife uh, left, means uh, divorce uh, taken. And presently, he is serving this temple and uh, again, he is willing to get married and preparing for another uh, grihastha life. So, from that point, I can experience that this temporary material life is so temporary and we are trying to uh, get benefit or trying to get enjoy from this world. Even in, in devotee family also, we are trying very much uh, hard to maintain our family and to satisfy all family and family members. Are you also in Mayapur? Uh, no, Maharaj, I am in uh, Orissa. <coughs> Which temple? Um, Bhubaneswar? Uh, it's uh, 260 kilometers away from Bhubaneswar. It's uh, a remote district, a tribal district. Oh. Do we, have a, do we have a center there? Uh, yes, uh, Maharaj, uh, small Namahata center is there. Okay. So you're able to maintain yourself okay. How do you maintain your... What do you do? Recording in progress. All right. Hare Welcome Krishna. back, everybody. Oh, yeah. Hare Krishna, everyone back? Yes? Yes, Maharaj, everybody is back. All right, let me hear from some people who spoke together. Maybe uh, Chandrika Maharaji, would you like to share with us what you talked about? Yes, Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Uh, I, will, uh, talk, I was talking with Gopal Ganeshaya Prabhu, and uh, he shared um, this story in his family uh, that um, his grandmother, uh, she um, she lost her husband very early in her age, and uh, she had to take care of the whole family. And uh, she take, took care, um, and, but in the end of the life, um, she distributed her own wealth to the family. She gave everything, uh, and in the end of the life, life, she was sick, and actually no one from the family wanted to take care of her because she was too annoying if I understood correctly. Uh, Gopala Prabhu. <laughs> yeah, that was the story that he shared about this realization. Yeah. So that's the family <laughs> family dealings, eh? Not very not very cooperative. Yeah. And the grandmother gave everything but nobody wanted to take care of her. Mm. <laughs> Okay. People are sometimes annoying. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. For yeah. And so she left the world in that kind of state, nobody taking care of her? Huh? Yeah, she, she left the world. Uh, she fell down from the uh, from her bed and then because she was hospitalized for one two days, then she left the Oh okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, so that gave you some realization about the material world. <laughs> All right, let's hear from somebody else. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I'm Karuna Tara. Yes, ma'am. Uh, may I share my, uh, my uh, I mean, like when I, as earlier I told kids, when my son died, I became very upset. That, uh, that time I felt that I should not live. How old was your son? 
He was uh, one and a half month old. Oh, just a baby, yeah. One and a half months, yeah. Yes, Maharaj. So I felt very upset and I felt that I should not live, I mean, here and I lost all hope. But then my Prabhuji, uh, Mahavira Rupa Prabhuji, he, uh, he told me like everything here is just temporary and you should, you know, surrender to Krishna. And that time I learned that uh, by surrendering to Krishna and doing devotional service and becoming Krishna consciousness, that is a true happiness. We, um, only by that we can get true happiness that way. So I, you know, from the, that time I, I started doing this, uh, becoming Krishna consciousness and doing devotional services and all. Uh huh. Good. Yeah, we have some pastimes like that about children leaving the body, and it's in uh, Chaitanya Leela. You know, I mentioned about the son of Sri Thakur, how he died, and then we have this uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We have the pastime of Chitraketu's son. Yes, ma'am. Mm. So these things are there to help us in these kind of situations. Yeah. Yeah, Maharaj, may I ask regarding uh, one thing regarding Chitra Ketu Maharaj, like uh, Angira Muni blessed Chitra Ketu Maharaj with the uh, son, and uh, no, but he must he must be already aware that uh, the son will die. That is why he kept the name of the son as Harsh Ashok. So why did he give the son to Chitra Ketu Maharaj when he already knew that this son will become the cause of lamentation for Chitra Ketu Maharaj? Well, Chitra Ketu wanted the son so badly, he had to have it. The, the only way he was going to get through it was he had to give him the son and let him have the son and then he can experience the difficulties. Sometimes you have to go through these things in order to understand the nature of life. That we had so much attachment, he had so much desire to have the son. So, okay, let him have the son and then after the son dies, then he will understand a bit more. He will have a bit more realization. He will understand more the nature of the world. We have to hear about these things. It, it helps to awaken detachment for us. It said that if you, when you hear about the destruction of the Yadu dynasty and about Lord Krishna leaving the world, then that helps us also to become detached from the world. But sometimes just hearing is not enough. Sometimes you have to experience it yourself in order to understand it. You have to go through it. You have to experience the death and lose the person you're very attached to. And then it helps to have a, we have a deeper appreciation, a deeper realization about the nature of the material world. Yes, Maharaj. So basically, uh, when the son left, uh, when his son left, then he must have been uh, more morose uh, as compared to the fact when he was not having a son. Yes. Yes. Very painful. But then see Narada Muni said, they said to him, they said, we could have told you all this before, but you wanted the son first. You wanted the son at the time. He wasn't ready to hear spiritual knowledge. So it was only after the son died that he was ready to hear. He was more receptive. And he yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else like to say anything? Are we okay? All right. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, you go ahead. Uh, in our group, we uh, discussed uh, uh, about uh, when a person was uh, rich, all the relatives were uh, very close to him and uh, you know, always there for him. But um, once his uh, business uh, uh, shop and uh, there was uh, no relatives around to help him. Uh, all the people who used to be with him no longer uh, became, were his friends at that time. So we see that uh, once the person is rich, there is a lot of relatives or uh, friends, but not really when they are in trouble. Mm. Yeah. yeah, they're in trouble. That's the nature of the material world, right? relationships, it's a lot of trouble. But we can't avoid that, it's there, it's an inevitable, it's a part of life. But we have to be able to deal with it in Krishna consciousness. The temporary nature of these relationships has to be understood by Krishna consciousness. We cannot be neglectful 
We cannot all just go off and renounce, but we have to understand everything which happens in relation to Krishna consciousness. So that's important for us. It's not just uh, bad luck. We couldn't say, oh, it's bad luck, oh, I did this wrong, I should have done... You know, we, sometimes we think like that, or maybe we should have had the better doctor, or maybe if we'd taken more medicine or something, or maybe if I was in another place it wouldn't have happened. No, we have to understand this is all the plan of Krishna. In the course of time, influenced by our own karma, then everything happens. It's all taking place. It's not by chance. In the very first verse of this chapter, chapter number 30, it talks about the clouds, how the clouds move under the influence of the wind. In the same way we are all moved under the influence of time. We move by the influence of time. You know, we come to this world, we take our birth, and by the influence of time we grow up, we go to school, you may go on to college, you get married, you get your own family, and you get old, and we die, and we leave the body and go off again. You know, that, that is all going on under the influence of time. Material relationships, we have to understand they're temporary. The real relationship ultimately is in the Kingdom of God with Krishna. But we're here in this material world because we desire, we desire to enjoy these temporary relationships. And we experience all the misery which they bring. All right? The happy end. You can see here, the happy end. There he is, he's on the bed and he's, you know, and they're crying, Oh, don't leave us. Of course, some of them, they want him to go quick. Let him go quick, we'll get his money. <laughs> and other, you know, and he's saying to them, take care of my family. He's saying to his eldest son, take care of the family, look after everyone. All right, let's read. Who's got the, uh, let's read. Can, has somebody got a book there? We can read text number 10 up to text 18, the translations. He secures money by committing violence here and there. And although he employs it in the service of his family, he himself eats only a little portion of the food thus purchased, and he goes to hell for those who, uh, for whom he earned the money in such uh, an irregular way. Text twelve, oh, so text eleven. When he suffers reverses uh, in his occupation, he tries again and again to improve himself. But when he is baffled in all attempts and is ruined. He accepts money from others because of excessive greed. Text 12. Thus the unfortunate man, unsuccessful in maintaining his family members, he uh, is bereft of all beauty. He always thinks of his failure, grieving very deeply. Text 13. Seeing him unable to stop and support them, his family and others do not treat him with the same respect as before, even as miserly farmers do not accord the same treatment to their old and worn out oxen. Text 14. The foolish family men, man does not become averse to family life, although he is maintained by those whom he once maintained. Deformed by the influence of old age, he prepares himself to meet ultimate death. Text 15. Thus, he remains at home just like a pet dog and eats whatever is so neglectly given to him. Afflicted with many illnesses such as dyspepsia and loss of appetite, he eats only very small morsels of food and he becomes an invalid who cannot work anymore. Text 16. In that diseased condition, one's eye bulge due to the pressure of air from within and his glands become congested with mucus. He has difficulty breathing and upon exhaling and inhaling, he produces a sound like gora gora, a <laughs> rattling within the throat. Text 17. 
In this way, he comes under the clutches of death and lies down, surrounded by lamenting friends and relatives. And although he wants to speak with them, he no longer can because he is under the control of time. Text 18. Thus, the man who engaged with uncontrolled senses is maintaining a family, dies of great grief, in great grief, seeing his relatives crying. He cries most pathetically, in great pain and without consciousness. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhupada. Yes. Okay, so we had the description there about the dying man. And how true it is, it's so close, it's just reality, isn't it? From your own experiences, some of you also describe similar situations in your own homes. This is the, the, the end, the happy end, <laughs> as they described it in Srimad Bhagavatam. So material life is like that. What is the solution to these problems, you know? The, now we're going to get old, we're going to have these problems, it's going to be there. What is the solution? Let's read Krishna's family or Maya's family. It is ju judicious, therefore, to give up family attachment before one attains old age and take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should employ himself in the Lord's service so that the Supreme Lord can take charge of him and he will not be neglected by his kinsmen. From text 13 purport of this chapter number 30. So Prabhupada is explaining here the need, we have to take shelter of the Lord, we have to take shelter of the Lord, we have to somehow give up that family attachment. Before old age comes, we have to somehow detach ourselves from, from that situation. And Prabhupada suggests how to do it, employ himself in the Lord's service so that the Lord can take charge. Then we won't be neglected by the kinsmen. So Prabhupada explains our Krishna conscious centers, particularly in Mayapur and in Vrindavan, they're meant for that purpose, that people can retire, that they can come retire here and take up some humble service in the service of the Lord. This was actually what Prabhupada wanted, that uh, Prabhupada himself came to Vrindavan in his old age, right? Prabhupada left his home, he saw the difficulties in his family life and he got out from the home. Prabhupada was thinking he would stay at home and try to preach, but then he saw so many difficulties. Of course, he had a business initially at Allahabad and that business failed and then came back to Calcutta, he was living in Calcutta and he was trying to do some preaching work but nothing was happening, it wasn't. And then one time even his own books, his uh, Shastras went missing and he wondered what had happened to them. And he thought that one possibility was that somebody in the family had taken the books and sold them to go and buy biscuits or something, to drink with their tea, to take with their tea, <laughs> something like this. So Prabhupada saw, he saw time to leave home. He saw the family members were no longer respectful. Previously when Prabhupada had a business and he was maintain, maintaining the family, then everything was nice. But when the economy, when his business failed and no longer had so much money anymore, then people became, began to be disrespectful to him. So he saw the change in the family life. He saw that the family members were not so uh, polite and courteous in their dealing with him. They didn't give any respect to him anymore. And he understood it's time to leave home. 
His Holiness Mahavishnu Goswami was one person who had similar kind of experience. Uh, he, w he was a family man and he also left home and came to the Krishna consciousness movement. And he explains, he said, it's, he said, it's better to the that it's better when you leave home that they should be saying, where did he go? He said, if, 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 if you don't leave home, one day they'll be saying to you, when are you going? <laughs> so if you wait until they say, when are you going, that's not very good. It's better you go before that happens. And when you leave home, they should be saying, where did he go? So we see... Vidura coming home to Dhritarashtra's, to his brother Dhritarashtra, and Dhritarashtra's there in the care of the Pandavas, and Vidura comes to preach to Dhritarashtra and to get him out of the home. And he really preaches very strongly to him. And Prabhupada's purport is very powerful. Prabhupada's purport in that section, he said, Five thousand years ago there was only one Dhritarashtra, but he said today you'll find a Dhritarashtra in almost every home. People are so attached to the home, they don't want to get out of the home. So they should. You know, you may say you have a wife, it's alright, you can take your wife with you. We see Gandhari followed Dhritarashtra. She followed him, that's the duty of the chaste wife, she follows the husband. So the husband goes to Mayapur Vrindavan, the wife should follow. They go there, they can live in the holy dam and do service. Take up some service, that's the idea. We see Ajamila in the pastime of Ajamila there in Srimad Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, how Ajamila leaves home and he goes off after the Yamaduras came and they were countered by the Vishnu Duras. Then after that, then Ajamil understood he had to go from the home. He got out of the home and he went up to Hardwar and he stayed in a Vishnu temple in Hardwar. And he gave up his body on the bank of the Ganga and went back to Godhead. So this is the preparation. You have, we have to prepare for the end of life. This is what we're supposed to do. Some people... They just want to stay home. They stay, hang on to the home and they're trying to make eternal arrangement, an eternal place for themselves in their home. They don't understand. We have to leave home. So better oh, to... Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu? Uh, may I ask one question, Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, you mentioned that we have to prepare for leaving the body by going to uh, Mayapur and Vrindavan in the last uh, stage of life when we have fulfilled the family responsibility. So, uh, since it is a preaching mission, so is it, uh, uh, is it uh, like a choice that, okay, we, uh, we remain connected to the temple which we are connected to and continue the preaching or we, after the family responsibilities are over, we go to Vindabun or Mayapur and take some humble service as suggested by you or both are uh, okay? Both are okay. No difference. Yeah, you're doing some service for a local center, that's all right, you can do that, yes. But, uh, but the Holy Dham, uh, the significance of Holy Dham is much more than what uh, is there for other places, Maharaj. Well, that's, the temple is also Holy Dham. The Holy Dham is where Krishna is, Krishna is in the temple. You know, some devotees, great, some of our devotees in ISKCON, they choose to leave the body in their own centers there in America or somewhere in the West, they leave the body there. Not everybody comes to the Holy Dham to leave the body. You can leave. Sometimes it's just easier just to be there, you know, maybe as you're a devotee, then we have, you have the association of devotees who care for you and who know you and they can comfort you and help you and, and help you to leave the body. So sometimes it's easier just to be in our own place rather than go to the Holy Dham. You come to the Holy Dham, nobody knows you maybe, and you're here in the Holy Dham, nobody may be taking care of you. But in your own place, you know, you have a group of people there, you have devotees and everyone, they can help you, they can be, they can be uh, taking care of you. Yes, Maharaj. So it's practical. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. 
Rashikar Prabhu's hand is up, Maharaj. Yes, okay. What's the question? Or comment? Rashikar Prabhu, please go on. You have to unmute yourself. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, my question is that uh, why to wait for the uh, old age? One can die at any point of time. We should prepare at right at this moment only. Uh, that was my question. Okay, well, why wait for old age? Of course, we can die at any time. Well, you have to consider your situation, you know, are you a family man or not? You know, do you have a family? Maybe you have a family, you have children to be educated and so on like that. You know, you have some responsibilities. And so it's not that everybody's just simply sitting there and thinking about death. You know, you have to go on with life. You may live to a ripe old age, you don't know when you're going to die. Yes, at any moment we may have to leave the body, but not everybody's just thinking, oh, I'm going to die, I have to leave, the, prepare to leave the body. You have other duties to do also. You maybe, you, maybe you have a family, if you have a family, you have to take care of them, you have to think of them also. Children have to be educated, you know, have to get some opportunity for education. My wife has to be also properly situated. Maybe you have relatives also, different responsibilities, I don't know. You have to consider everything, Individu every individual circumstance is going to be different. Or somebody else, okay, he's a single man, no, com no responsibilities, he can just simply give up everything and dedicate himself fully for the service of Krishna. All right, that's very good if you're in that position. Not everybody's in that situation that they can just do that their whole life, give their whole life for the service of the Lord. But you know, time and you, know, you have to consider every individual situation. What do you want? What's its position? You understand, Prabhu? Are you a single are you a single man? Huh? About my son. I can't hear you, Prabhu, I'm sorry. Maharaj, I'm thinking about my son. Oh your son? Yes, Maharaj. How how old is your son? Twenty seven years old. Huh? Twenty seven years. Twenty seven years old. Yes, Maharaj. Is he a devotee, full-time devotee? Uh, he's not. Uh, he's down. Uh, he's down. He's down. He's down. He's down. He's down. He follows the four devotee principles. And uh, he reads uh, Bhagavad Gita Shlok, lectures of Shri Prabhupada. And he follows all these things. And uh, now I'm thinking about his future. What he should do, whether he should marry or he should do full time job in Krishna consciousness like that. Hmm. So, what's he doing just now? Uh, he, uh, he just completed a master's degree and he just got the job this month only. Oh, he got a job already? This month only. Okay. And so he wants to work? That's why that's dilemma. Uh, whether uh, 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 I want him to be full time, uh, uh, Krishna consciousness. So this is should be sorted out. Well, not just what you want. You have to think also what he wants. For him also, it's dilemma. That uh, whether he should be full time, Krishna consciousness or not. Yeah, does he want? You have to see. It's not always, an ash ashram life is not suitable for everyone. You have to consider what's his nature, you know, he's been living at home, he's been living with you, family life, and you want him to go and <laughs> you know, take up food, it's not everybody's choice. You have to see. So that's, you have to consider, you have to discuss with him what, what does he want to do. And 
other people are there. What does your wife think also, you know? Nothing. So you have to discuss, you know, not everybody is suitable to ashram life. Well, it's very nice if he likes to be in the ashram and do full-time service for Krishna, it's very good. But it may not be so suitable. You don't know what he wants. If he's not happy, if he doesn't like it, it's not for him. You have to see what his nature is. Okay, we'll go ahead. All right. So, next section. Man died. We heard about the man dying, meeting death there with all the family there. And they were watching him leave the body and the man was grieving and choking and everything. And then, the time of death, then the Yamaduras come. Right? Text 19. Who's going to read for us? Text 19 up to 27. May I read, Maharaj? Yes, please, Prabhu. At death, he sees the messengers of the Lord of death come before him, their eyes full of wrath, and in great fear he passes stool and urine. Text number 20. As a criminal is arrested for punishment by the constables of the state, a person engaged in criminal sense gratification is similarly arrested by the young dutas who bind him by the neck with his strong rope and cover his subtle body so that he may undergo severe punishment. Text 27, 21. While carried by the constables of Yamraja, he is overwhelmed and trembles in their hands. While passing on the road, he is bitten by dogs and he can remember the sinful activities of his life. He is thus terribly distressed. Text 22. Under the scorching sun, the criminal has to pass through roads of hot sand with forest fires on both sides. He is gripped on the back by the constables because of his inability to walk and is afflicted by hunger and thirst. But unfortunately, there is no drinking water, no shelter, and no place for rest on the road. Text 23, while passing on that road to the abode of Yamraja, he falls down in fatigue, and sometimes he becomes unconscious, but he is forced to rise again. In this way, he is very quickly brought to the presence of Yamraja. Text 24, Thus he has to pass 99,000 yojans within two or three moments and then he is at once engaged in the torturous punishment which he is destined to suffer. Text 25 He is placed in the midst of burning pieces of wood and his limbs are set on fire. In some cases he is made to eat his own flesh or have it eaten by others. Text 26 his entrails are pulled out by the hounds and vultures of hell. Even though he is still alive to see it, and he is subjected to torment by serpents, scorpions, gnats, and other creatures that bite him. Text 27. Next, his limbs are locked off and torn asunder by elephants. He is hurled down from hilltops and he is also held captive either in water or in a cave. Whoa. Okay, <laughs> nothing very pleasant to look forward to, hearing about the Yamaduras and what they're going to do when they take people. May I ask a question, Lord? All right, Prabhu, yes. Um, so this, this description by Kapil Dev is, um, it is relevant for any, any uh, living entity that is taken to Yamaraj? Or is this like... Um, uh, specific because it does it doesn't say whether it just so everyone any anyone who is who has done sinful life will have the same process and at the end the elephants will take off his limbs like that because I understood that it's according to one's karma that one gets uh, punished yes well of course it's not that everybody would have the elephants tear off your limbs. It's going to be different for different people. But we're hearing about some of what happens, a typical situation, 
the sinful person is taken to Yamaraj. And we heard about the description, the journey which you have to make there to go to the to Yamaraj. You're taken by the Yamaduras, how they bind you and they drag you and you're bitten by dogs and these things. And then we come before Yamaraj. Now we don't hear about elephants ripping off the limbs everywhere, but we do hear Yamaraj asking, we heard different things, you can read different things, for example, Maharaj Nriga, Nriga, the story of Maharaj Nriga, he went to Yamaraj and Yamaraj asked him, do you, you said, he said, you've done a lot of sin, you've done a lot of pious activities, but you did also something sinful. So do you want to enjoy the pious activities first or do you want to suffer the sin first? And so Maharaj Nriga chose to, pun, to suffer for his sin. And so that, he, you know, Yamaraj was asking him, what do you want, you know? So that, that we have that description. And so we do hear different situations. You come to Yamaraj, it's not the same for everyone. Yes. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Okay, so real life experiences. Uh, uh, we heard the description in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The man is terrified because he sees these horrible people come before them and they're angry mood and they're really frightening and terrible looking people and uh, people feel naturally very afraid just to see them and the, but when the doctors see this they they have a they call this terminal restlessness syndrome his holiness badri narayan maharaj he was pre he preaches over in uh, san diego and los angeles there and he uh, there was one man who was in the hospital there, one of the, an elderly man who was in hospital and he had that, he had the experience, he actually saw the Yamadurats. He said, he came to the temple and he actually told them, he said, you know, I, I saw these people, I saw these people, they came to, they came, they came. He was in the hospital, you know, somehow he was in the hospital and it happened that these, the Yamadurats had actually appeared to him. So people actually have some kind of experience of these things. It's not just only imagination. But doctors and medical science, they will try to cover it up. No, it's, it's just some restlessness syndrome. They don't understand what's actually happening, what's really taking place. Okay. So. Thank you so much. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, I wish to share an experience. May I share one experience? Please. Real time experience? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, actually one Mataji told me that when she had malaria once, so she saw some uh, dark uh, people coming near her. Dark. I mean, they were very, uh, I mean, they had very dark faces. And then uh, they said that we have to take her. But then when they saw the beads around her neck, they said that uh, we can't take her because she has beads around her neck. So then they went away. Oh, wow, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, well, we should have our neck beads on. But you know, it's it's not so easy just to keep these neck beads on. There was one family one time, they, you know, they had a, a relative in their family dying, leaving the body, and they wanted to put neck beads around their neck before they left the body because they thought it would be good for them and protect them. So they got some neck beads from our temple and they put them around the neck of the dying person. But before the person died, the person ripped them off in their, you know, just unconsciously just took them off the neck. <laughs> it was interesting that, you know, you, you, can't, you can't just get away with these things so easily. You might be lucky, you might be able to keep them on, but not everyone. Sometimes the beads they rip them off. You rip them off yourself. You just, you're not used to having them around your neck. And if people are not pious, they don't have that piety, they don't have that faith. They don't like these things. Okay. Alright, so that we're going to hear about the cycle of birth and death. Verses 28 to 34. Who would like to read? Hare 
can read. Yes, please, Prabhu. Thank you. Men and women whose lives were built upon indulgence in illicit sex life, in, in illicit sex life, are put into many kinds of miserable conditions in the hills known as Tamisat and the Tamisat in Rawrama. Lord Kapil continued, My dear mother, it is sometimes said that to experience hell or heaven on this planet, for hellish punishments are sometimes visible on this planet also. 30. After leaving this body, the man who maintained himself and his family members by sinful activities suffers a hellish life, and his relatives suffer also. 31. He goes alone to the darkest regions of hell after quitting the present body, and the money acquired by envy and other living entities is the passive money with which he leaves this world. 32. Thus, by the arrangement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the maintainer of kinsmen, is put into a hellish condition to suffer for his sinful activities like a man who has lost his wealth. Therefore, a person who is very eager to maintain his family and kinsmen simply by, by black methods certainly goes to the darkest region of hell, which is known as Anhatamisa. 34. Having gone through all the miserable hellish conditions and having passed in a regular order through the lowest forms of animal life prior to human birth, and having thus been purged of his sin, one is reborn again as a human being on this earth. As a human being on this earth. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. So, of course, not everybody will accept that there is reincarnation, that there is birth after, there is a giving up one body, taking another body. People born in the Christian tradition and Islam tradition and so on, they won't accept that. They don't believe in life after death, that there's a, you take birth again, or they won't believe that you can take an animal body. They have their own different ideas about these things. I spent some time in the Philippines, in the Philippines it's a you know, it's, it's, it was a Spanish colony for some years, so the Spanish people, they brought the Catholic religion there and Christianity is spread all over the country there in the Philippines, so it's a strongly Christian country and they don't like to hear about life after death. They say, one life, one judgment, <laughs> right? One judgment, no, no, no appeal, <laughs> something like this. One life, one judgment, no appeal. And so we, the whole, the whole principle that if there's only one life, and yeah, and you're either going to go to heaven or to hell, at the end of this life. This is the the Christian teaching on this that either you go to heaven. You stay there eternally, or you go to hell, and you stay there eternally. So, we can point out to these people that, that, that if this is true, then it takes away the concept of any mercy on behalf of the Lord. That if the Lord is going to do something like that, He's going to put a soul into hell eternally, then where is His compassion and mercy? There should be the opportunity for the soul to be redeemed and to reform. But this concept is not understood in the Catholic tradition. And they just say, one judgment, <laughs> and you either go to hell or to heaven. And so then some, we may ask them, well, what if a man is half good and half bad? And then they have the con they say, well, purgatory, purgatory is somewhere in between heaven and hell, <laughs> you know. And then they have concept that the soul in the humans is different from the soul in the animals. These kind of things. They have all these different ideas. They, they have no real clear understanding about the nature of the soul. His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami one time came there to the Philippines and he arranged a meeting with one uh, very senior member in the Catholic Church. He was a cardinal. 
His name was Cardinal Sin. <laughs> Cardinal Sin. He was a Chinese man, born in the Philippines, and he was Catholic. He became a cardinal. So Tamal Krishna Goswami met with him. And Tamal Krishna Goswami had prepared some different questions about the, the religion he wanted to ask them. And he, he asked him about what is the concept of life in the kingdom of God? And he, he was asking to the cardinal, and the cardinal just simply said, well, he said, well, that's not in our theology. We don't have this in our theology. We don't have an answer to this in our theology. They have no idea what life is like in the kingdom of God. Of course, people sometimes speculate about it, and they think they have, you see pictures of angels playing harps, sitting in the clouds. <laughs> but there's nothing about this in their theology. They have no idea. There's so, there's so many things lacking. But, of course, Srila Prabhupada did give great credit to Lord Jesus Christ and to Prophet Muhammad also, that they did a lot to help to reform people, to bring people up to a, a better level, to at least, at least they believe in God. They, they do believe in God, that there's a God Some They don't know who, who He is or what He's like, but they do believe in God. So that, that's a good thing. Okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one question from text number 31? Yes, Prabhu. Actually, in the translation, it is mentioned uh, passage money, like uh, uh, it is said that uh, the passage money is there. So, uh, the money he acquired by envying other living entities is the passage money. So the sin, the passage money refers to the sin accrued by uh, earning money by wrong means? Yes, of course, that's it. You know, he got the money by wrong means, right? Crooked means he got the money. It's not his money. And he's trying to use that money for maintaining his life. And, uh, and Maharaj, text number 33, it is mentioned that uh, a person who is eager to maintain his family and kinsmen simply by black methods. So again, these black methods refer to uh, means which are not approved by the Shastras. Yes. Right. Right. This is all Dharma Saglani. Right. If you do something against the Shastra, Dharma Saglani. It's not good. Black means, black money, you know, maybe promoting the slaughter of animals, transporting the animals to be slaughtered, this kind of thing. Or you may be even distributing alcohol or these kind of activities. Yes. So there's, yes, yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. There's so many different activities, different industries which go on in the, in the name of business, which are it's all just sin. You know, we have these, uh, you have bars with alcohol, and then you have prostitution, and you have gambling also, so much gambling going on all the time, people gamble. And then you, you've got a lot of pornography also, and you've got even anything which is actually not according to Shastras, then it, it, it's uh, harmful for the society. You can see, for example, Bo Bollywood movies, you know, what do they promote, you know? What are people learning from Bollywood movies? They're just simply, just simply degrading the minds of the public in the name of entertainment. Yes, Maharaj. So we're trying to preach against these things. We're trying to give people positive engagement in the service of Krishna. You know, there are ways to make livings, honestly. It's not that people have to go into uh, all kinds of vices in order to maintain their families. There's honest living. People lived honestly for many, many thousands of years, and just simply working the land and growing crops, taking care of the cows. And there were people who were we read about the life in the times of Lord Krishna, how were the people living there in Vrindavan, you know, the people in the village in, in Nandagram, and like, they were very nice, they were very opulent, very comfortable. 
they were well taken care of. And all the ladies had jewelry and nice clothing, and they were all happy. And they were just, what were they? They were simply taking care of the cows and feeding the cows, and they had milk, and they were making ghee and butter and so on. There was no question of big motor cars and petrol and all of these things and computers and all of this stuff, you know. Of course, we're using it for the service of Krishna, but, you know, we can live without it also. There is natural living according to God's plan, live with the gifts of nature. Yes, my Lord. All right, we'll go ahead, let's see, here's, how can we escape? We're hearing about all the problems, how can we escape? Would someone like to read this for us, please? Okay, I'll read it. It can be concluded that if someone is not willing to enter into hellish life, as in Tamishra or under Tamishra, then he must take to the process of Krishna Consciousness, which is the first class yoga system. Because even if one is unable to attain complete Krishna Consciousness in this life, he is guaranteed at least to take his next birth in a human family. He cannot be sent into a hellish condition. Krishna Consciousness is the purest life and it protects all human beings from gliding down to hell to take birth in a family of dogs or hogs. Srimad Bhagavatam 3.30.34 purport. So this is the value of Krishna Consciousness. We may think life in Krishna Consciousness is difficult. We may think, oh, it's, it's, it's not easy to be Krishna conscious. It's much more difficult to be a karmi. To take up life in the material world is unbearable. Krishna consciousness may be a challenge for us, but material life is much worse. And the result of material life is simply go to hell, enter into these different hellish conditions at the time of death. But if we take up Krishna Consciousness and we stay in Krishna Consciousness, it protects us. As Prabhupada says here, at least we're guaranteed next birth in a human family. In a human family. And it will be a good family also. We know from the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes, if we practice uh, the devotional pro if we practice yoga even for a short time, we still may have material desires, then we, can, we go to the higher planets and we satisfy our material desires there, and then we come back to this planet and take birth in a wealthy or aristocratic family, so that we can again take up the spiritual path. And if we have advanced a lot, if we have made a lot of progress in our Krishna consciousness, quite advanced in our yoga, then we would immediately take birth in a family of devotees. So to take birth in a family of devotees, that is a wonderful opportunity for Krishna Consciousness. And Prabhupada describes how he was born in a family of devotees and his own spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, also born in a family of great devotees. So that's a very wonderful birth. But if we simply take up karmi life, all sinful activities, next life we'll take birth in a family of dogs and hogs. And of course, some, some people are so foolish, they think, well, what's wrong with that? They think, oh, dogs have a nice life. Oh, really? <laughs> well, some dogs, not all dogs. If we see dogs in America, they may have quite a nice life. They're given a lot of treatment, a lot of, <laughs> they, get, they get a lot of care. But dogs in India, dogs in Korea, do, dogs in China, they're not much taken care of, you know. They, people eat them, they kill them, eat them. So, 
We should understand proper use of human life. Here's another quote from Srila Prabhupada. No one can live within this material world eternally. The phenomenal world is created, maintained and destroyed by the finger signal of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, a devotee does not desire anything in this material world. A devotee desires only to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This servitude exists eternally. The Lord exists eternally. His servitor exists eternally. And the service exists eternally. So sometimes people ask us, what does Sanatana Dharma mean? So here, this is the meaning of Sanatana Dharma, that the service exists eternally, and the servitor and the Lord, they also exist eternally. And so this is Sanatana Dharma, eternal service to the Lord. And Prabhupada talks about the, the finger single signal of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord gives a sig signal. This, this sig signal was mentioned also in relation to, I was teaching that we were studying the, the beginning of the third canto in relation to Uddhava and Vidura. Maybe you remember when you studied that, about the, the Lord was departing from the world and he gave a, he gave a signal to Uddhava that he should go to Badarikashram. And so we have to see the signal from the Lord. We see different signals from the Lord. Sometimes the Lord shows a signal to us that we have to take up Krishna consciousness. We have to get free from this material world. We can see sometimes these, we get signs or signals from the Lord. He's telling us to get out, give up this nonsense activity. Get to Krishna consciousness. Go and be a devotee. We learn from Krishna not to waste our time in the material world endeavouring for the useless things of this material world which have no value and are no good to us. Get out from this world and take full shelter of Krishna consciousness. Because this world is not eternal. And Prabhupada told us this modern civilization is doomed to failure. It is just a question of time. It is falling apart. Every moment we can see more and more destruction, more and more chaos in the world. There is no future in this material world. We should take shelter of Krishna consciousness. We should be convinced of the futility of materialistic life and take up Krishna consciousness with great enthusiasm and conviction. Okay, are there any questions? Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Um, one question related to what um, you just said, that we should see the futility of this um, material world. So Devahuti expressed, Devahuti expressed that uh, her disgust in, just before, um, in chapter 25, just before Kapila Dev started speaking. So, um, is that also the consciousness of a devotee, that he feels uh, disgusted by the material world? Yes, that helps. Yes, that if, we, if we are thinking that there's some good, something good in the material world, this is going to be an obstacle to us cultivating Krishna consciousness. There's a verse in Prayers by Queen Kunti. Queen Kunti says, Janma Aishwarya Shruta Shribiya Edamana Madapuman Naivarhati Avidatam Vai Tuam Akinchana Gochara. Akinchana Gochara. She uses the, prop, the, the word, the term Akinchana Gochara, meaning the property of the materially impoverished. That if somebody's on the path of material advancement, trying to cultivate birth in a good family or 
material opulence and prosperity, our good education and bodily beauty, if one is attached to these things, then they cannot know Krishna. But Krishna gives himself to those who are materially impoverished. They've, they give up the material, they're not attached to the material world. They don't identify with the objects of the material world. They see it all as Krishna's energy. And they see it for the service of Krishna, not for their own pleasure. This is the idea. We want to see everything that is Krishna's energy is meant to be used for Krishna's pleasure. Just like we spoke in the beginning about money. That you get money, or, or you have land, you have property, use it for Krishna, for the service of Krishna. And don't use it for sense gratification. Don't exploit. Don't just think this is mine, this is for my enjoyment. But understand it's given to us by the grace of God, and it's meant to be used for His service. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, may I um, may I say another uh, anecdote? Um, yeah, please. Regarding, yeah. So um, regarding the the hellish um, hellish conditions and the journey to hell. So uh, sometimes I will give my daughter. My daughter, she's almost seven. So sometimes I'll give her Bhagavatam books to to watch the images there. And uh, at all times, she has, she has gone through all the images practically, but sometimes she would ask specifically to, to look again at the, at the paintings, at those pictures about the hell, different hellish uh, places. And I've asked her, why do you like these, do you like these pictures just to look more than others? And she said, yes, actually, because it's very interesting. So I was just um, seeing this as an interesting uh, phenomenon to share with all of you. Oh, she considered these pictures very interesting, eh? Yes. Although she has seen so many pictures in all the temples, but these are very interesting and she is actually asking questions about each and every picture to understand what's going on there. You explained to her the different sins which the people did. Yes, according to, to, to whatever knowledge I have. It's mostly in the fifth canto, so... Yes, right, in the fifth canto, yeah. Right. Yeah, according to, yeah. Description of the hellish planets are there. Yes, and yeah. we hear about the different hells which are there for the... and the different sins which people do and what they undergo for punishment for their sins. Actually, all these descriptions of hell, they're also there in the Buddhist religion. If you go to uh, many Buddhist temples, which you, you may, uh, you know, I often have visit a Buddhist temple, have a look to see, and I often see these different things. They, they promote hell. The, the Buddhist concept, you, the whole Buddhist concept is to detach people from material sense gratification. So in Buddhism, they do things like they have a, a dead body, and they'll keep a dead body, and people will meditate on the dead body, they'll see the dead body, and they think that ultimately this is the end. And this is the, and, and the Buddhist temples, they have also the... Uh, they have the crematorium, and so they bring the dead bodies there to the crematorium, burn the body. And sometimes the monks will go and they'll sit in the crematorium and they'll just sit there and meditate because they, ultimately this is the end. Because Buddhism, they, for them, ultimately everything is zero, there's nothing. And so they see the world as nothing, and they meditate on nothing, on the endless nothing. Life has not, no meaning, and they stop. So they meditate on the, and they have a picture, they, they don't have much pictures, they have pictures of hell, and they have pictures of a skeleton, the bones of a body, and sometimes they'll keep the bones of the body there in the temple, just for people to see. This is what you are, you are these bones, you see, you're just simply these bones, they have no life. 
In this way they understand life has no meaning. And this is their Buddhist philosophy. So they meditate on the suffering of material life. I was asking one monk about, why do you chant on 108 beads? And he said, well, there's 108 different kinds of suffering. So that is their meditation about the different suffering in the material world. So we see in Krishna consciousness, we don't just meditate on the suffering, but we see also the positive aspect. There's the bliss, there's the pleasure of going to Krishna to be in the spiritual world and to take part in the pastimes of the Lord. And we have the positive side of life. Buddhism is all just a negative, oh, the world is suffering, life is all suffering, and they want to stop everything and negate everything. But in Krishna consciousness, we don't just see the negative side, we see also the positive side. That there is Krishna consciousness, there's the application of bhakti yoga, devotional service, and taking up the activities of being a devotee, and chanting, and being blissful. Buddhist monks of Buddhism, they cannot do that. They're not allowed to be blissful. You shouldn't be blissful. <laughs> you shouldn't be happy. You shouldn't show any emotion. That is their principle. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Yeah, uh, Maharaj, one question may I ask? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I am thankful to you. You shared about the Vaishnava philosophic uh, doctrines and also about the uh, Satyug incarnations. Uh, however, uh, I was unable to understand the principal incarnation for Satyuga. Uh, so there are many names. So is Lord Ramchandra a Satyug incarnation, Maharaj? No. No. Ramach Lord Ramachandra is a Lila incarnation. It's not a Yuga avatar. And he doesn't come in the Satya Yuga. Okay. He comes in the Treta Yuga. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Yagya Avatar, Yagya Avatar is a uh, Satya Avatar? No. Oh, Yagya Avatar, uh, Yagya, and, uh, and that, that's also Treta Yuga, isn't it? Yagya, Treta, Treta Yuga. Because Satya Yuga, the process is meditation. Sit and meditate. But the, the Yagna, that's the Treta Yuga. So the Yaga avatar comes in the Treta Yuga. Okay, so uh, there is no principal incarnation as such in the Satya Yuga. All the incarnations are there. Uh, the mentioned in the list, uh, the few names are given, like uh, different names are there. Narayana. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, they're all teaching the same thing. They're teaching the process in that different in that age, meditation, sit and meditate, right? We're told the description, how he wears, what he wears and everything. He's going to sit and meditate. Yeah, and, and okay, so there is no principal incarnation, all the incarnations, they have the same uh, distinct. Yeah, they're all Yuga Avatar. I, I don't know if it's one name for all these people or if they're all different people. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Okay. And, and Maharaj, this uh, Lord Krishna, he belongs to Ghosh dynasty or Vrishni dynasty because in Canto 9 and Canto 10, uh, there are texts which mention references of like uh, Kansa belongs to the Ghosh dynasty, whereas Queen Quinti, he, she belongs to the Vrishni dynasty. So Lord Krishna belongs to Ghosh dynasty or Vrishni dynasty or both? Lord Krishna comes in Yadu dynasty. Yadu dynasty. So he is not related to the uh, dynasty of uh, Devki, Mother Devki? Yeah, well, Mother Devaki, they're all, you know, she, she's married in the Yadu dynasty, right? Okay, she's she married Vasudev. Okay, Yadu dynasty. Hmm? So Lord Krishna is not in the Bhosh dynasty and not, neither in the Vrishni dynasty because Queen Quinti is in the Vrishni dynasty. But she, she came. To live with Pandu. Yeah. Okay. Right? She came to live at, with, uh, she got married to Maharaj Pandu. So, with the marriage, it would change. Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. 
Maharaj, may I ask me a question, please? Yes, please. Maharaj, uh, like we say, uh, like uh, what I've heard is Nara Narayana Kamal Satyu. Is it is it correct? Nara Narayan what? The Kamal Satyu. This is it. The come in such a yuga, yes, I think that's right. Yeah, they come in such a yuga. The well, they're they live at eter their eternal, you know, the the Lord's eternal uh, expansions. They live there in Bandari Kashram, performing austerities for the benefit of all the people. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Maharaj. They're still there. They're living there now. Just like Lord Kapila, he's still living, he's at the Ganga Saga, his ashram there, is it Ganga Saga? Lord Kapila is still residing there, he resides there eternally. Yes, Lord. But no one will be able to see him, he will be unseen actually. Well, you have to have the eyes, you have to have the qualification. Yes, yes ma'am. Like Maharaj Nidhiman, there all the gopis they live in the form of uh, uh, the tree. I mean, uh, Tulsi Tulsi tree. Oh, the gopis live in the form of Tulsi Maharani trees, huh? In Nidhiman, like uh, everyone says, like that. Uh huh. Yeah. For the service of Krishna, yes, they take birth of Tulsi trees to serve Krishna. It's very nice. We want to serve Krishna, whatever form we can take, it's very good. So Tosi Maharani, of course, she's the pure devotee. And so it's for the service of Krishna, she, she appears. And by the grace of Srila Prabhupada, now we have Tosi going, growing all over the world, practically. People worshipping Tosi. And people t getting the blessings of Tosi Maharani. So it's very important. Mm. Cows are also very important. The cows also, I don't know who are the cows, they come. They're also very dear devotees of Lord Krishna. We have to take care of the cows. We have to understand how dear the cows are to Lord Krishna. So there's so many things to be done, to be understood. We see Krishna, everything is Krishna's energy, Krishna's expansions, Krishna, we're all Krishna's prakriti, all living entities, we're all Krishna's prakriti. So we want to see Krishna in everything, everywhere. We're never separated from Krishna. So it's nice to develop that consciousness. So Lord Kapila's preaching to his mother, he wants to detach her from the material life. He's telling her about the nature of this time, how time de 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 deteriorates everything. And in the course of time, we grow old and we're going to see everything crumble and taken from us. And our own life, our own body also is going to crumble one day and be taken from us. We have to give up this body. So it's not good to remain attached to the material body. We have to be willing to give it up at any moment. Prabhupada talked about he knew the one doctor. He wanted to get, he wanted to live four more years. He said, I still have so much work to do. And he begged, please give me four more years. And the doctor said, how can I, he said, I cannot, I said, I'm not, he said, I can do it. We have to recognize when the time is up, we have to leave the body. And so this is Lord Kapila's teaching strong. We will hear more tomorrow, tomorrow, his strong preaching. Oh no, tomorrow we won't hear, right? Next week. Next week, right. Okay. All right, so we'll go on next week, chapter 31 and 32. Any other points or questions? Anyone? Okay. So, 
Thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Jai.